Welcome again to another segment of the Grassy you Knoll on the September 28th, 2006. And we have with us today uh, Alan Watt. He's been on a number of times before. The website is cuttingthroughthematrix.com. We'll talk about all that later. Uh, but we thank you for coming back again, Alan, and I hope everything's okay uh, above the 48th parallel. Yes, it is. It's very busy right now. I'm getting lost to the wooden for the for the winter. Well, that's right. Yeah, you, I was going to ask you how many inches you get on the ground yet, but that's a little premature, isn't it? Yeah, well, we've got lots of lots of rain at the moment. Okay. Uh, you didn't have a look in your skies today, did you? Yeah, I, I saw them spraying. Yeah. <laughs> they're spraying heavily into the clouds and, and yeah. bringing the rain on. So yeah. That's why everybody's got sinusitis. Well, we came out this morning, and um, if you didn't know what they do, when they do it pre-dawn, it looks, it really does look like cir- uh, cirrus clouds. It truly does, yeah. You know, and so nobody ever knows, but, you know, unfortunately, you can see those little, little base stripes left in there, so yeah. And, and talking about the way things are, I just want to throw something by you. Um, I'm just starting to see all these things come together, not that anybody else isn't out there, but this whole idea about the American people countenancing the talk about torture, okay? Yes. Yeah. All right, fine, because it's going to happen to the other guys. Two, um, this bit about tribunals now, which means trial without jury, mm-hmm. and then something came down the pike today uh, that someone sent me from Toronto, of all places, and that is what's going on here, and that is they're going to find justification to even uh, label American citizens as unlawful enemy combatants. Yes. All right, so, so let's yeah, get to... Bill 6166. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't get any better than this. So 6166, six, then you're left with 6666. Six, six, six. They love these games. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now do American people understand, and the answer is no. No. That now you have allowed lot of torture, folks, because you never spoke out about it. Um, you haven't resisted the idea of tribunals. And so now... People would say, well, you've got nothing to fear if you get nothing to hide. But the point is, now they're turning the cannons at us. Now, we get labeled terrorists, those of us inside the United States, and guess what they can do to us? Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is the Soviet system. I would... I would yeah. No, 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 go ahead. I was, gonna sp- I was expecting you to say this has like been the, the centuries-old system. Yeah, but it really was perfected in the Soviet era. And that's why they brought uh, Cherkov and other ones over from the, the Soviet uh, Union uh, to be head of Homeland Security because they've implemented it. It's a, it's a psychological warfare as much as a physical one. And as you say, it worked in the Soviet Union and it, it will therefore work here. Uh, more easily, in fact, because the public are, uh, they think they're free. Uh, interesting thing you said about Chertoff, <coughs> a Jersey boy, what do you know? Um, I, I know he had a, a citizenship still connected to Israel. Uh, it, did you find that he was in um, uh, the Soviet Union for any period of time? Or? Yeah, he has been in the Soviet Union for quite a while. In fact, a lot of the top boys in Israel were uh, going back and forth to the Soviet Union from the beginning of the setup of Israel. Yeah. And I would say, maybe it doesn't matter, but I mean, he is a creepy-looking human being. Uh, you know, they're all creepy. <laughs> because they're such utter liars. And they can lie um, convincingly to themselves, even. And I think uh, George Orwell explained that process, which they're, it's either natural for them or they're trained in it. Um, in, in his book, 1984, he goes through the process of being able to lie convincingly to the public, uh, draw up a fresh lie, and immediately forget it as soon as you've said it. They do this all the time. Watching uh, your DVD, and I was going to let this uh, wait until the very end, but I, since you mentioned Orwell, i like to move it up front only to get your take on it. I have not yet seen, really, or heard, you... Um, and deal with a particular entity, and that is one of the things that happened, uh, I guess, a week ago as a guest, um, and we asked for documentation, and I'm looking for it, that Orwell was at Tavistock. Now, uh, what about these think tanks? And that's what I was going to ask you. I don't think you go on too much about them, but, I mean, what, what do you think of them, and what do you think their role is in the whole global scheme of things? Well, we're run by think tanks, and we have been uh, for an awful, awful long time. Uh, George Orwell came from a long lineage of uh, bureaucrats that worked for the the British uh, national government. And um, he sort of broke away. His father was appointed as the overseer commissioner 
for the British Opium Company for Britain in Burma. Uh, that was a crown-owned corporation, all the shareholders being royalty. That, was that still called the British East India Company? Uh, no, at that time it was called the, the, the British Opium Corporation. I mean, that was straight out, that's what they called it? Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, my Into the 1930s. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, and, uh, or Orwell was, was picked at university, uh, the Ivy League university that his father had gone to, uh, Cambridge, and that was, uh, that was standard, that's where Lawrence of Arabia was picked and trained, uh, as the CIA still picked them today, they picked them at the I Ivy League, other students and they train them for their role in life. Now, would you say that Orwell was kind of repulsed in the end by what went on, and hence he writes uh, Animal Farm and uh, 1984? Yeah, he was. Uh, he realized that he'd been used uh, to write so uh, socialist propaganda through novels, and uh, after Kessler and, and H.G. Wells were other ones, uh, they wrote through uh, fictional works ideas that were socialist in value uh, to get the public to follow them uh, and uh, when, when uh, Wells was over to uh, not Wells when, when um, really Blair is George Orwell his name was Blair right. uh, when he was over in the Spanish Civil War that's when he met the communists the real hardline communists and realized that there was a, a bigger puppet master manipulating all sides um, I read uh, an article, and I can't remember where it was, well, I know where it came from, what an uh, email group, pretty reputable too, and, but I read some kind of um, excerpt that when Orwell was in Spain, I, I guess he really was quite frightened for himself, apparently. Did you ever read anything or hear anything about that? Um, he was more afraid that when they caught on to the fact he'd woken out of his conditioning, his own training, and realized what was going on, that, that he would be assassinated. And, and you know, that's exactly what it said. He either was neurotic, oh, no, not paranoid, uh, which doesn't make you wrong, we know, that's right, that someone was going to hit him, or in fact somebody was going to hit him. That's why he, when he went back to Britain, he was shunned by the socialist groups and uh, the big meetings that he used to speak at, because he says, hey, we're all being used to you, there's a bigger player uh, operating, and they're pulling the, the strings of all parties here. Uh, after that, he went up to the north of Scotland, to a little island, uh, way out of the way, and he demanded to know when the boat came in every month uh, who was on it in advance, because he, he thought he was going to be assassinated, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> do you know, I mean, we all kind of suspect, but do you know any kind of degree of certainty that his death within a year of the publication of that book was in fact uh, organic due to TB? Um, what was, was what, pardon? Uh, Orwell's death. Uh -huh. Was that <clears throat> because of uh, the condition that he supposedly had the TB, or, I mean, is there oh, something well, little... Initially, he'd been taken in when he came back from Spain, <clears throat> or it's actually after the Second World War, during the Second World War. He was in hospital for a while, uh, being treated with streptomycin, which had just come out at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't give him another drug, which goes along with it, in the hospital, and he began to hemorrhage to death. Wow. So his friends pulled him out of the hospital to save his life. And that's when he realized there was an attempt to kill him there by the authorities, the government. Now, the other person <coughs> um, you mentioned uh, being a product of a, I guess, a think tank and, 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 uh, and being intelligence was uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Yes. <coughs> he also apparently voiced his uh, discontent and uh, can we assume that uh, his motorcycle accident might have been a little murky yeah he was on a Rudge motorcycle and uh, he traveled the road many many times and um, a hay cart pulled out supposedly from a field which is certainly plausible and he hit it but it is known that he knew too much uh, he had been recruited at Cambridge along with 20 other famous students who became very famous in history and trained in Aramaic languages and set off to the Middle East to set up newspapers to start giving out new propaganda to the Arabs to get them ready for a new system. And he, he, just, he simply knew too much. Yeah. Well, in that case then, um, you've seen the movie, have you not? I saw the movie, but I prefer, his book that he wrote himself 
with a, it's called Seven Pillars of Wisdom, and it's worth the read. Okay, and that chronicles this whole um, experience and, of course, his attitude and assessment of what was going on there. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, also, moving into what would be the first thing that came to my mind watching uh, the, the video, and this is Reality Check Part 2. Uh-huh. You mention oftentimes about the priesthood, and I'm thinking it's priesthood kind of in quotation marks. Yeah. Were the priests from the beginning of whenever, were they mostly not so much spiritual individuals or maybe faking it as they were what would be akin to mob bosses? Yeah, I think really um, they came out after studying. Now, there's different theories on it. There's some hints and clues in their own inner religion as to who they are uh, because they have a, a deviancies of all kinds. <laughs> and there's a hint that they were the ones who rebelled against nature, you might say, the natural way of, of people and tribal systems. And at one time they were killed off within tribes. And then, uh, as I guess, as people began to feel more civilized, as we call it, they would save their lives and, and they'd, they'd literally guard them, put them inside caves. And from then uh, they grew and grew and they observed the people below, their habits, uh, their behavior, because the first uh, thing you have to understand to conquer people, you have to study their nature and then you, you can manipulate it. Uh, they, they studied the stars, the movements, and when they came down, they could tell the, the people when to plant, when to grow, because they knew the, the solar, lunar, and stellar times. Uh, it's all, all, all sciences, you might say, they studied. And then they brought in a thing called commerce and, and money. So then you're, you're saying that the priests uh, att- uh, attain their um, status because they did kind of get it and they had some kind of, uh, uh, not, I wouldn't say secret knowledge, but something certainly that wasn't being passed down to the peasants. Uh, yeah, it was the, the, the first thing they had to find out was the human nature, um, simply observation. Uh, observation, detailing, and, and watching to see if every generation would repeat the same behavior. Then you can manipulate it. Now, is there any kind of um, racial... Um, lineage between priests or was it something that most civilizations just by nature kind of popped up by themselves uh, no there is definitely a connection um, people who, who are brought up in a system as we are today take everything for granted in that system that's the beauty of the system itself it's a macabre beauty because if your parents can't tell you that something was wrong with it all or what exactly is wrong with it, we accept it as being normal. And that's what Lenin said. He said the, he said the public don't realize that a thousand ways that society could go. They must think the one they're born into is the natural one which evolved. And people do that. They actually do. Uh, so you have to change it from a natural system into a new system. It's the first generation that causes the problem. Once that's done, they will indoctrinate their children, and the children will think it's natural. Money is the key to it. Uh, money is an unnatural product altogether. Uh, it started the whole, it took over from barter, which is basically exchanging that for which you need, to commerce and profit, which is different. Profit is different from, from barter. Well, it's funny you use the word natural, because actually it is an unnatural, but natural offshoot, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a substitute for natural barter, uh, plus a deviant substitute in that it, it entails a system called economics and profit. It's the profit that kills us. It's the profit thing which controls us. That's the unnatural part. And taxation, which is a spin-off of money. You can't tax people very very easily um, by simply taking goods from them or a sack of potatoes. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm thinking that. It still lets them grow their potatoes, but they pay a, another price for it, more or less. Yeah, and then the money is taken. You see, the substitute, mm-hmm. which is labor, is true. And they can then hire men to be an army or police or whatever and buy war machines, which we will build if we get paid money. Uh, all of that, none of it, in fact, could exist without money. Um, did the priests, were they actually, though, the power? Uh, were they rulers? Uh, no, they were behind. They always got the puppets for rulers. You what? 
a front man and is a ruler. Okay, well, where I was going to go with this, and I just wrote these notes down, I had priests, and I have an arrow, kings and queens, in other words, they create the kings and queens and kind of hang back behind the screen. They hang back, yeah, it's all done through history, kings and queens uh, had advisors, uh, mean advisors, and we see that very well with the Catholic Church, which had no opposition for uh, almost one and a half thousand years, uh, where every king and queen and prince and nobility had his own personal counselor uh, that was a Catholic priest from the Vatican who was responsible directly to the Vatican. Uh, and they arranged the marriages, they looked through the genealogies. It was a form of breeding program to get the proper type of king and queen uh, that would do your bidding. Uh, because it's very, it's true, you know, you can, you can breed particular psychological types through inbreeding the same way as Plato taught about 2,300 years ago. You can create um, someone who's either very gentle uh, or very aggressive uh, or aggressive and easily managed by those with wisdom. So we can actually breed types of people for the purpose we've chosen. And by the way, we always think of uh, philosophers as being these benign subjects. Um, mm-hmm. But really, uh, Plato was an elitist and, and w- was proud of it. Himself, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, Plato went through uh, in his book, The Republic, which was really not just a, a future utopia for the elite. He talks about why they should have it. He, t- he said that it's the reason that you and I, you're talking to his fellows, in a story form, you and I uh, have such understanding of nature, meaning people um, and behavior, is because we've lived before, so they believe in reincarnation. Well, I, w- I would guess uh, they're right in a sense. In this sense, I mean, I, I think the the spirit benign and malevolent continues on. But you know, one of the things I thought was probably the most disconcerting that he wrote about was the fact that he believed that the uh, the children should be taken from their families, uh-huh. brought out to the countryside, and instructed by the philosopher kings. That's right. So then we, we fast forward, and um, it, it sounds like a really, you know, groovy, warm, fuzzy title. Uh-huh. Hillary's, uh, it takes a village to raise a child, uh, like heck it does, Hillary. And, isn't, and is this not the extension exactly of what he was talking about? Uh, absolutely. He hit it right down. He had the agenda right down. He said we can breed all kinds of people ultimately. Uh, we can breed all kinds of people for different tasks. In other words, the same way you breed animals uh, for, for size, uh, aggression, uh, passivity, whatever. We can breed people for the same way, especially bred for the family where genetics are going today, to make specialized types of humans. And Plato also mentioned um, that uh, ships. Well, you know, you just struck something in me when you said the word, uh, they called them it's. And you know what I'm thinking? And we understand that it's not ill-intended by us. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. But when we call children kids, kids is, yeah. isn't that kind of a pejorative... Uh, well, Lenin said it. He said we shall use terminology to dehumanize the people, to separate them into types. And as soon as you take away the word child uh, and, and substitute with kid, a baby goat... Yeah. Um, which is deeper than it sounds, actually. Uh, you see, sheep, domesticated sheep, initially came from goats, uh, and they were inbred and inbred to get certain traits. So the adults become sheep, you see. Mm-hmm. When you're young and a bit more wild, uh, you're a kid, that's what they call it. So there's different meanings behind it. But yeah, it dehumanizes the people. I, I have to tell you, ever since, uh, and that's not my idea, somebody else brought that up to me, and I had to say, you know, I think you're right, and I've just come to the point now where I can't use it any longer. Yes. Um, I just think it's disrespectful, and once you know it, and you know the real meaning, mm-hmm. you can't use it anymore. You can't, no. No. Um, uh, also, uh, going back, if I can, to the analogy that we uh, departed from when I said, okay, priests and kings, if we were to fill that out today, I mean, I kind of scribbled on bankers, to, to prime ministers and presidents. Uh, you want to refine that as far as uh, who hides behind what these days? Oh, it's, it's so multi-layered. It's, uh, ultimately, the entire system of the world uh, revolves around money, which very few people truly understand, even all the con men that sell all the uh, survival stuff, they might say, or ways out of it or around it. Um, 
money is an unnatural thing. We're all trained from school onwards. And that's the whole purpose of schooling, is so that you can serve the system by earning money, which they can tax back from you, which is labor, really. And then they can employ, as I say, agencies, think tanks, uh, and build armaments and get armies together with money. You can't get an army together uh, with, without pay. They'd all go home eventually. So money is the key to this. This, this is a system, mm -hmm. an entire system revolving around money, and yet only about a dozen families in the world, supposedly, uh, the world bankers have the right to uh, declare that any this, this country or that country can print up so many dollars. It's a, it's a complete con game. Sure. And the, the guys at the top, when you ask them privately, they'll admit this is a pure con game. It's a carrot system. We're all trained to oh, yeah. look after carrots. Yeah. Well, down here, uh, and everybody who's in the States... <coughs> um, can do this. I've done it twice. Uh, go to my bankers, you know. And I, all right, I don't want to sound elitist, but if you don't, you don't go to the tellers. Perhaps you go to uh, one of the officers, and you ask them. I said, "Do you realize that the Federal Reserve is not federal?" I did it twice, and twice they had no clue. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine that those in the profession yeah. who have something hanging up behind the counter that says, you know, a Federal Reserve Bank, da da da, uh -huh. and have no idea? I know, I, I talked to a banker a couple of weeks ago, and it was it for inquiry I was making about something to do with ordering if I set it up. And I sat for over two hours lecturing her on the history of economics and money going back for thousands of years. And she was fascinated by it. She didn't know any of it. <laughs> I know. Uh, also, uh, just to take a look back at education, um, did you happen to hear uh, that George Carlin five-minute rant that was going around about the way things are, more or less? Um, uh, I don't think so. Uh, it was great. If you don't mind, I'll send it to you. I mean, it's life with obscenities. Uh, you, maybe you can call it gratuitous. I mean, I wasn't offended by it because, I mean, he was mad, I was mad, and it just seemed to fit. But one of the things he said about education was that he says they don't want anybody to critically analyze anything. They want obedient workers. Obedient workers. That, that's what the mortar board hat that you wear in graduation. It literally does. It signifies that your natural head, the round head, has been squared, perfected, they call it, shaped the ashlar of the masons. And you, are, you have now been dumbed down enough to be approved, quality approved, to, to enter their system. That's what it means. And the big boys laugh about this. Yeah. The high masons sure. laugh about that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, uh, I know there are a lot of good teachers out there who are doing uh, instinctively what they know is best and also having to deal with curricula and other um, mandates being sent down. And, of course, now we're going to get to a point where it's going to leave the local school district and become a national thing. It is, and then right after that it will be an international thing. Yes, yeah, it already is. It, it is, again, like you said, they're, just, they're incrementally exposing it to us, but the plans have been laid in, and they're ready to go. But you know what I find so tragic? And another one of these elephants they got by, by us, you know, like we talked about the Federal Reserve, uh -huh. is how that maggot, John Dewey, could have been given the education system of the United States to mold, you know, and him, and Bloom, and Skinner, yeah. and they're praised. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I mean, here's characters out of the uh, Platonian or, you know, Platoistic mindset, yeah. Well, they don't think they look at children as kids, widgets, who are meant to be trained. Skinner put his own daughter in a cage and studied her and got away with it. What does that tell you about who's behind them? He got away with it. Uh, um, you find that Lord Bertrand Russell was given royal charters by the Crown to open up experimental schools uh, in 1900 onwards where he was allowed to do things, promote uh, sexual, uh, pre-pubertal sexual contact with the, with the students. In a time when a, a, a molester would have been hung, he was given royal assent to try these experiments because the experiments were to be used ultimately worldwide on the public and their children. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I was in the education system and I had to make unit plans and lesson plans. And so, you know, I, I didn't think the way I do now. This, this was 1995. Uh -huh. But I was still an adult who'd been around. I still didn't get it. When we do the lesson plans, the number one thing is, and the goal, is the behavioral objective. 
Yep. And never once did I ever say, why do I care about behavior here? Or aren't we kind of like trying to teach people things? Mm-hmm. And so there it was right in front of you. And, of course, Bloom's taxonomy is loaded with that. Uh, whereas they invert and they ridicule what sometimes is base knowledge, which we all need. Otherwise, how do you add? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If you know where uh, England is, by the way. Uh, and what they what they hold up highest is synthesis, where they come up with their own ideas. Yes. This is an education. It's social indoctrination into political correctness, and it's done scientifically. Um, and, and I always go back to Beria, who was the head of the NKVD in the 1920s and 30s in Russia, that became the KGB. And he gave a, a, a talk to the common term around 1932. Mm-hmm. Uh, international communist associations um, and in that speech a, a tremendous speech he said he said it used to take us a generation around 70 years uh, to make to get a, a change in society through through behavior modification of the public through repetition repetition until they start parting it he said now we have it down to every five years we can put major changes in and it was he meant through kindergarten mm-hmm. and he said eventually we'll be able to modify it uh, per annum so what you've got today is a child going into kindergarten at two years of age being programmed in a scientific fashion and that's what uh, Bertrand, these are the very words of Bertrand Russell programmed in a scientific fashion for the things which they will want to experience until they hit 20 or 30 these will be changes in society which they will accept readily thinking it's normal well and next year the ones who come into that kindergarten get programmed a, a, a year ahead again mm-hmm. for the next part of the change it's incremental yeah. and this is exactly what um, Plato was talking about where uh, the philosopher kings may be the education system but the education system is taking over and is slowly uh, usurping more and more parental rights now they'll give you the uh, excuse well there's so many bad parents in single family homes uh, single parent homes out there and that's yeah that's okay that's the reason that's not the real reason though the people who are implementing it on the local level believe that it is yeah. but we have what's happening and you said it uh, you're having longer school years you're having longer school days and you will have earlier entrance into the system. Mm-hmm. And, of course, some believe, and I, I think Charlotte Isabel does a good job of this, who uh, lives up in Maine has written a book, Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, and she's saying, so what's with all these uh, K-20 to curricula? Yes. Grade 20, what's up with that? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, here we go. Ed Gwyn, too, is another book out by Gatto. Yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, the Hidden History of Education, well documented. Mm-hmm. And he goes through the fact that, uh, that when all this system came out of Germany and Prussia, back in the 1700s and 1800s and he gives the statements by all the top players and they were quite open about their function of education was not to give them just a survival ability within a monetary system and be good taxpayers but it was also to give to make well behaved obedient citizens yeah that's funny you should mention Germany because that rears its head again in the 20th century when Dewey and the boys went over to that uh, one school of uh, psycho- uh, was it experimental psychology that's right and you know the other thing Alan and I'll, we'll get off this and I want to do some business with you. Uh, but you know, all in America, and we were talking about think tanks and such, time and time again, some of the most nefarious characters seem to be connected to the University of Chicago. I know. I, I get hits from them all the time because even on the internet, uh, they have massive uh, funding from the Homeland Security and, and high-tech uh, uh, equipment there to try and hack certain people's programs. So they are a part, they are part of Homeland Security. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. We're talking with Alan Watt. The uh, website is cuttingthroughthematrix.com. Uh, I also want to tell you folks, um, by all means, if you want to ask a question or make a comment to Alan, you can do so. Visigoth at hotmail.com. IM services, Yahoo, Viz1400, or MSN would be Visigoth. Okay. Ha- that being said, and by all means, in the second half hour, uh, please chirp up if you wish. Now, the website you've got, Alan, is, is growing by leaps and bounds. So why don't you tell us the new developments that are out there and, and what's all available? Uh, I have um, shows going back from radio on Shortwave International from 98. Um, I've got more of them now on disc. Uh, there's two out now, 12, 12 hours per disc. Um, I've got the two DVDs up for sale. I'm making another one this winter. Um, I rap in music with it as 
well to show you how music manipulates the mind. And uh, I also expose a lot of the esoteric stuff. Well, at least at least the middle range esoteric uh, on the video. Um, I've got three books for sale, which are really good for deprogramming. I, I hit you in the, between the eyes with which should be obvious in a symbolic fashion. So I, I tend to use the techniques that have been used on the public to try and deprogram them. Yeah. All right, and. Um I have to tell you, the other uh, yesterday we had somebody on uh, called Freeman, uh -huh. and he does a lot with symbology as well. Mm -hmm. And here's one of the things I've got to go back and take a look at, in the sense of it's always all around you. Uh, and when I have these discussions with my friends who don't want to be taken out of the cave, uh -huh. um, if I go back to my old high school, this is where I'm, I'm going with this. We had a high school built in like the late 20s, and it was a beautiful stone edifice, and with the kind of turret castle type tops. I mean, it looked like something medieval, right? Well, the joke used to be every so often that they would take a picture of one of these gargoyles <laughs> that were supporting like this little ledge below the, you know, the turrets. Uh -huh. And now I'm thinking to myself, what was with that? I mean, w you know, was it a, a Freemasons thing? I mean, I want to go back to my old school and I want to take video of all that's up there and find out whether or not this was enough. I mean, it isn't going to really impact us in a sense, but it's, a, it's an example of at least the joke is on you. Yeah. You know, it's like we never ask, like, why did they do that? These demonic wing-looking creatures, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> and nobody... Yeah, and you you got to find the pillars, uh, wherever they have pillars, <laughs> and you, you count the fluting around the pillars and so on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's all Masonic and it's all coding, yeah. Yeah, I, that'll, that'll be a good reason to get, go back up to Dodge. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, in the DVD also, uh, you talked about uh, the stage of humanity. Mm -hmm. Now... Uh, are you envisioning, uh, because of what the research you've done, that there is one coming that may not be as humane as the others before it? Well, there's no doubt about it. Uh, scientific magazines, scientific meetings, world meetings, have been meeting for every year. But in the last ten years or so, they've been coming up more openly as to the new designed perfection of humanity. Mm -hmm to be done by through genetic engineering and they mean it they're quite serious this has always really been the agenda where they are going to make uh, purpose made humanoid types for specific tasks right along the, the way of Plato but by using genetics uh, rather than just uh, selective breeding um, and that's for the for the, all of the worker uh, societies the elite themselves like Charles Galton Darwin said and uh, Arthur Kessel says that the elite themselves must not change themselves. They'll do it in the old-fashioned way uh, because um, the new type of worker will be unable to think or reason for themselves, uh, meaning they'll have no personal survival capabilities. They'll be programmed, whereas those, the elite who are uh, steering the ship uh, must retain those faculties of self-preservation uh, in order to steer the ship, planet Earth, basically. Um. Well, this bit about um, the beyond selective uh, breeding. Uh -huh. Now, we're not even supposed to know that that's going to be on the horizon. So, I mean, that's a given, as you well know, and rightfully so, yeah. with the, the long-range plan. Mm -hmm. But we haven't really seen, we've just seen, I think, the beginning of the softening of the populace, yeah. just like what we talked about with the tribunals and, mm -hmm. and torture. Yeah. Uh, and I think we had an episode down here that's emblematic of what's to take place with ter the Terry Schiavo situation. Yeah. But we're looking at two things, are we not? That um, depopulation uh -huh. beyond, and I mean, I, I'm talking about beyond selective breeding, but also the uh, killing of, or the eliminating, shall we say, because they wouldn't want to use the K word, the eliminating of, uh, shall we say, challenged life from birth. Oh, absolutely. And also those who are older, and infirm, and it's like it's the end of the road anyway. That's why this, this bit about hospice is okay, but there's a lot of hemlock in hospice. Yes. So would you, I mean, what about what's taking place now? Uh, are we being prepared to accept this kind of depopulation? Yeah. Yeah, we're programmed primarily through fiction, and there's never been a time in history, even though mankind has an infinite capacity for fiction, um, there's never been a time up until now where uh, from morning till night we're bombarded with electronic uh, radio or television shows or movies uh, other people's conditioning right into our brains 
uh, along the same agenda and, and, and uh, we don't even take part in the debate our opinions are given to us we simply adopt them and you, you hear all the time about um, uh, efficiency efficiency uh, and crisis after crisis even though we don't really have the crisis, possibilities of crisis and therefore the, the need to, re to reduce and it's all to do with economics itself this artificial system of economics uh, where nothing will exist in the, in the near future without a specific function to serve society and so the useless eaters will be eliminated either quickly or gradually um, that's how human life is valued today it's not valued through any kind of religious system that the public are aware of I say that the public are aware of there's a religious system at the top um, it's to do with efficiency where nothing will exist without a particular purpose um, the elimination of the useless eaters as Bertrand Russell talked about that's what's coming you know with technology and science they don't need so many people anymore Russell wasn't all that needed guy was he part of that whole uh, coefficient club oh he was born and he was a member of very old British aristocracy and nobility uh, related to what rock royalty with uh, big parents and so on and um uh, he worked with Tavistock Institute and other think tanks. There's other ones above Tavistock. Tavistock is the main one for the, the, the predictive programming that we get fed through movies and talk shows and, and uh, prearranged debates on television. Uh, that's where our opinions are given to us or downloaded into us. Uh, but there's, there's higher institutes in, in England uh, for nobility and royalty uh, than Tavistock. Well, all right, so now we have amongst the, um, the, the masses this uh, notion of depopulation. And also that's being prepared uh, in children's heads because we've gone to all this group work and collectivism where your, your value is only that which it is to the group. Yep. You, not, no intrinsic value being a human life, okay? That's right. Now, on the other hand, you have the elites probably, as we spoke about before, kind of kiddingly, about how long these guys like Rockefeller, Kissinger, and, and Queen Elizabeth II last and all this, yeah. but they have access to probably what? The best medical care there is, probably light years ahead of what they allow us. The royalty and Kissinger have mid-level, the middle level. Middle level? Who's on a top? Oh, the... Oh, there's ones above them. See, the worker class, and even Kissinger is still classified as a worker bee. And, and according, they use the lazy boy as the, the one who does no work. Those are the ones who have much the highest form. There are three, in all of this occultic system, there's always three main levels with, with categories within. And so we have, from professorship down, it's the bottom level of, of biology, um, physics, and so on. Uh, middle level is the Kissinger level uh, and Brzezinski level, royalty level, but the ones who, are, who generally keep out of the limelight uh, have a much higher level even still. And the, the ancient Egyptians talked about this too. Well, I wonder, like you said, with politicians and characters like Brzezinski, uh, Kissinger, uh, or Oriol Pecci, or whatever, uh, that in a way they are um, a, a bit vulgar because they've actually taken the bribe. Uh, they're very vulgar about it. I watched a documentary uh, uh, a couple of years ago here when Kissinger and Brzezinski were up uh, and it didn't appear together on the same show but they were interviewed by the same man for CBC and the arrogance just... and what, how they think they're conning the silly little people, it, it really flows out of them. They mock the public. Well, and I also think that the politicians and such, in a way, prostituted themselves, and they're going to be stuck with that because they did take the cheese. They didn't get into where they were because of any kind of elitism or blue-bloodedism. They got there because, like I said, they, I mean, I, I look at what's going on in the United States now, and I just wrote a column saying, do we ever ask ourselves why we allowed lobbies and PACs? Isn't that called bribery in any other form of, of business? Yes. You know, and then I take a look at everything that's being sent to Congress, what little is these days, and it goes, you know, the senators go 100 nothing on it. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody gives it resistance. I know. All right, listen. I want to get back into also this great uh, leap forward, if we could. But before that, uh, you do have a comment and a question. Uh, this comment regards school. It says at a certain point early on in school, I was told I was just there so they would get state aid, a warm body. Because <laughs> this was reinforced throughout my scholastic career. Mm -hmm. And that's another dangerous thing down here, Alan. And that is with these um, these SED classes and e ESE classes and all this. 
they have to have a good number, the same number, every year, which means if they were ever taxed with kids that were truly, truly impaired, they don't get in. They get mainstreamed. Or, if they don't have enough, they go out looking. Yeah. And some of these parents, and I'm speaking ex- about this, this rotten school district here known as Pasco County, I watched it myself. They went out and influenced some kids in who shouldn't be there. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So anyway, that's enough of that uh, rant. And I got another one for you. And uh, it says, uh, can you please ask Alan to give a few quick and easy examples of what to tell people to wake them up? I know some people don't want to wake up and are far too conditioned to, b- be, to bother with it. But for the people that are showing signs of waking up, he says, could you give us maybe five or six points? How would you start with an icebreaker and trying to get people to ask their own questions? If they truly are, at least you do have to ask a question to begin with. You cannot wake someone up who has swallowed reality as it's been presented to them. You can't do it for them. They have to at least become uneasy to the stage where they ask a question to you. Uh, if you have some of the answers, you don't suddenly blurt out everything you've heard on the shortwave radio and overload them. Um, you, you, you feed them that which they can comprehend, which will affect them personally. See, most people really only care about themselves, unfortunately. And so when you tell them something that's going to affect them personally in the near future, uh, that generally gets them motivated. It's the rare individual that thinks really outside the box and, and realizes that, that uh, um, what's going to happen to everyone is, is so diabolical uh, that you must participate in stopping it. Mm-hmm. Um, very few people uh, today are unselfish that way. There are some. Uh, I, I find sometimes what kind of helps, uh, and you're right, you can't do the whole nine yards there because any time, any, of course you've heard talk shows where somebody who gets it tries to go in and, uh, you know, to a coast to coast or whatever uh-huh. and kind of lay it out and, of course, if you try to do it in 40 seconds, you sound like a maniac. You do. You, you cannot float everything that you know is going to happen, uh, even if you have the documentation with you. Um, you can't flow it all at once. It's so different from the 6 o'clock news. The average person will classify you as crazy. They do believe, and, and Brzezinski said this in his own books, um, which people should really read. This man worked in the Defense Department. He worked with the Tavistock Type Institutes mm-hmm. of Psychology and Psychological Warfare and Technological Warfare mm-hmm. of Electronics and Technotronics. Brzezinski said the public are coming to a stage where they are unable to reason individually for themselves. Uh, they can only repeat that which is downloaded into them by the 6 o'clock news. That has happened with most people. Yeah, it has happened. Um, and this is just an aside. We're not going to spend any time here. But one of the things I'd like to do, I've I got to start to chart this, is uh, recently, uh, Alan, we've had down here with the uh, three networks and on the local feeds it just isn't like well they don't do it on like Monday you know on uh, on CBS or NBC or ABC evening news they do it in the morning the morning okay they got that crawler going mm-hmm. and they give you sports scores and stuff but I mean wh- why are we putting the crawler in so I just I want to see if I look at it across maybe a month's time uh-huh. whether or not something's being done there yeah you know because they don't do it just for nothing right that's right and, and are they doing it in Canada at all with your local uh, uh, oh, news programs yeah. in the morning? Sure we do. Okay. Uh, everything is so coordinated today. Everything that comes across the radio waves or television is cleared by high censorship committees. It's completely cleared. And to give you a clue about how, how the, the double think actually works is quite fascinating. Um, we tend to think of publishing houses as being there to help authors get works out. Yeah. <laughs> George Orwell explained in his own um, uh, book, his biography, um, he explained uh, when he found out himself that they're not there to help you get stuff out. They are there to select what the public will read. Uh-huh. And uh, it's the same with all media. At the top, there are controllers. That's why they didn't switch channels at news time, and you'll get the same blurbs and the exact same little television uh, shots from from all the same stations. 
all different stations using the same stuff and format, same topics. They're all coordinated from above because impor- information, uh, these are the information wars as they call it, and they are ensuring they have total control over it. Um, yeah. For decades, <coughs> seriously, for decades, since at least uh, the early side go back of like the 40s, mm-hmm. with the books that I've read that have been telling people the truth, uh-huh. uh, were never published by Viking or Random House. They've always been with small and, and for the most part now, uh, long gone publishing houses. Yeah. Uh, so thank goodness that they were around at a time. Uh, whether there were people's eyes to read, I don't know. It seems well, like that, there that, wasn't. That's it. You see, the U.S. told me they had a few. I don't even know about that anymore. Uh, whereas George Orwell found out in the 40s that Britain had none. They were all one big company. He yeah. found that out. Doesn't matter all the different names they go under. They were obviously all in touch with each other. And he found that out and he wrote about it. And uh, it's the same worldwide now pretty well. All right, I've got a, uh, a comment that's being thrown out there. If you can address it or bat something off it, by all means. If not, you know, I, it should be heard. Um, this is from a listener who just went back to school, back to graduate school. Okay. It says, uh, my professor said he expects an uprising in the universities within the next 18 months. Don't know how he figures that. Have to wait to get to know him better before asking him questions. Mm-hmm. Um, have you any indication that you think, I mean, I, I don't see, I think they're all asleep. Mm-hmm. I mean, the students, I mean. There's only one thing that would get them to riot, and that's when, it, and I think the, what they probably mean is they're going to cut back on the, their, their funding and their grants and so on. Well, I was going to say take away their cars. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, another one that said, I understand uh, the idea that we are being manipulated, but I don't uh, know how to weed out what I hear. Uh, and when I'm helping my children with homework, I look for the manipulation but don't see it. So how do you stop what you can't find? Um, uh, do you want to respond to that? Uh, well, you have to change your way of thinking. You have to think for yourself. There's hardly a thing you can read when you're really, really conscious that where you don't see the other side of it. You'll, you'll always see the intent behind. Um, it's like the movie They Live. I, I encourage everybody to, to get a copy and keep it and watch it many times because it's so full of an allegory of a reality done in a fictional form of this system. And once you're conscious, everything becomes very clear. You'll see it. The reason you can't see it right off the bat is because you're not totally conscious, because you still really believe in a benevolent uh, hierarchy. When that goes, you start to think for yourself. Uh, uh, We judge people by ourselves. I would never do this, so they would never do that. That's how simple it it is. That's right. I would also suggest, too, that the idea is maybe not to look, (coughs) excuse me, at every lesson by lesson, Uh but stand back and take a look at the spread of work over a month or two. Mm -hmm. You know, is there a general theme here? That would probably be more telling. When you're inside taking it unit by unit, it may not be as um, um, obvious, and I think that's the reason why. I mean, you talk about Fabian socialism. It's a great educational tool. You do everything little by little, and they don't know what hit them until the whole nine yards are done. That's right. So I would say, especially when it comes to uh, humanities, I mean, you, how, you can't screw too much with math, but uh, to take a look at what the unit means, what are the objectives of the unit, yep. and I think you'll find that's where you'll find perhaps not assignment by assignment. One other thing the, an individual wants to know, since they know you're from uh, across the pond, uh, basically what is the deal with boarding, school, um, boarding schools? Well, boarding schools is... Uh, it's not a new idea. The ancients used it too. For the elite or the wealthy, uh, eventually it became used for the middle class helpers. For the industrial era, they created a middle class. Um, where you send off your child children to boarding schools. And uh, so they're detached from the parents. Now the parents often, especially nobility, um, even the mother doesn't wean the child. They have a nursing mo- a nanny. And uh, the child has contact with the nanny, very little with his mother. And the whole idea is to give them um, an, ins- an estrangement from, from contact with people. Uh, they go into a system, the boarding school system, where they, they well, not used to be actually abused. Homosexuality was rampant with the masters of these, these schools. So, and they came out being very good workers for the system, psychopathic in a sense. Um, but they'd also stand up for the system because those who are abused will generally defend the abuser. So they, they stand up for the system and will, will, 
reenact the abuse that was done on them to others. It's a form of detaching you from human emotion and family contact until you, you belong to a system and you're, you're, you're dedicated to the system uh, as, as uh, differentiated from contact with your parents, for instance. The system is your parent. Um, before we run out of time again, Al, uh, please tell us about the website and uh, what's all there. Yeah, it's uh, cuttingthroughthematrix.com. And I go through, there's, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of free programs to download, uh, one free uh, DVD to download, and I have other things you can purchase, which keeps me going. It keeps the site up there. And um, I hope people look into it, because time is getting short, and eventually these kind of sites will be closed down. Uh, that's true. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, would you say, and you know, no one wants to be pinned down when they're, when they're uh, 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 producing something. But would you say perhaps the timeline for the release of the next DVD would, could be around springtime? Uh, maybe even before. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, probably the last uh, topic we'll be able to touch upon uh, before this time runs out, and that is something I alluded to before about this great leap forward. Now, uh, that sounds real nice, but uh, is there a little uh, something um, saturnine about it? Yeah. This is the little tongue-in-cheek thing behind evolution. Yeah. And evolution, there has never been any proof that anything actually changed from this into that. Never. It just doesn't exist. It's a Hindu philosophy, in fact, evolution is part of the, the physical reincarnation, you might say, along with the spiritual. But they are, they've always talked about the great leap forward where we, we change from one type of being to the next, a higher evolved type. The only way anything can truly evolve is through scientific interference. We know that for a fact. We can certainly change things. And the, the great leap forward is the perfection of society into a new type of almost robotic cyborg worker with a small dominant elite at the top, uh, the, the guardian class, um, the, the dominant minority of Charles Galton Darwin's book, um, The Next Million Years. So this is all planned uh, way ahead of time. They wrote about it before I was born. And uh, they're right on schedule. Well, you only gave one example uh, when you were talking about this particular uh, issue in the DVD, um, uh, Reality Check Part 2. But um, this is pretty interesting because you only mentioned this is with science being involved into making perhaps the better human being. And that was you mentioned Frankenstein, which is kind of interesting because that was really a an extrapolation mm -hmm. of what was going on in Europe at that time, I believe, by Galvani. Yeah. Right, who thought that they could basically give a, a 440 jolt to a human being. And that's right. He galvanized us all, all up to, yeah. That's where galvanized comes in, right? That's right. And, and of course, Shelley's wife uh, um, wrote the Frankenstein book because they all uh, were, were high Rosicrucians. They already worked for what they knew as, as the global society. They worked for the, the dominant elite, as most authors and poets do. Uh, they gave us our thoughts, even the deep those that we like. Um, so they, they knew there was an agenda coming up to do with science, which would alter humanity itself. And so they put the problems or the problematic things they would run through in fictional form, which was a form of predictive programming. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, but, you know, when we mentioned about Wells and Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, yeah. and, and that was, was that... Hmm. Was that, I always get them mixed up. He was T.S., right? Yeah. The D.H. was a who, too, but he was T.S., right? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they were malcontents, so to speak, uh, you, but you said you, they were using fiction as a way of, pre of predictively programming um, those generations to come, yeah. and yet somebody who didn't uh, meet with an nefarious end, let's say, in, in, in the event that the first two did, and who used fiction but then came right out and said it was H.G. Wells, right, when he comes out with Open Conspiracy and New World Order. He was so confident at the yeah. time. And H.G. Wells was a, a manic depressive and a paranoid, too. Uh, so he, yeah, he, he had real bursts of and a sexual deviant in many ways. All the basic food groups right there. He had all the qualities necessary <laughs> for his category. And uh, so, yeah, he was very confident after the League of Nations was set up. And he wrote about it, the thinking they'd already gotten, and he wasn't quite wrong, actually. Uh, they'd already gotten a form of global government set up in its embryonic 
reform and all they would need then was another war or two to bring the world public to its knees so that it would accept a global system and a new hierarchy uh, structure. What has interested me, but I think also it's been a bit of a, uh, not a distraction, but uh, uh, look at this hand. Well, the other hand does something else. To me, the, the blueprint for a global um, empire was the, the Vatican's desire for a second Holy Roman Empire. But it seems that besides that, I mean, uh, this, these characters who come out of Britain, <coughs> the Rhodes and, and the Rothschilds and this whole coefficient club and, and uh, the round table and the kindergarten, I mean, what is it with the Brits that they were like just so enamored of this stuff? It's all one system. Um, in the 1500s, when Rosicrucian first uh, burst forth, mm-hmm. uh, and Queen Elizabeth the first time, her, her whole court was Rosicrucian. Kabbalah was the religion at the time, uh, a, a mystical uh, capitalism. And so, uh, you see, you could not have two opposing systems uh, constantly in conflict with each other, which tells you that the Vatican system and the, the, the system in Britain, Rosicrucian, etc., were all connected. Uh-huh. They were all part of the same structuralized system, although they appear sometimes to be at opposite ends of the spectrum for the public's uh, point of view. But in reality, they worked in collusion. Yeah, I mean, we know there's a Hegelian dialectic when they, when they can create the problems, and that's a fake in, instigation, if you will, I guess, or a, or a um, you know, kind of confrontation. Yeah. Uh, and again, we look at it, and if, if Dr. Uh, Walter Beeth is correct, I mean, he's, you know, he, he, he claims the Jesuits sprung off uh, Freemasonry, which obviously was full of Protestants, mm-hmm. and so they could make their little fake battle. The you know the Catholics and and, and the uh, Freemasons. Yeah, and and they also gave Catholic branches to to make them think they were opposing the Protestants mm-hmm. at the bottom. And yet Albert Pike talks about uh, at the top himself. He said where uh, the third degree Masons are brought in from two opposing camps. Right. Uh, at least the guys at the bottom think they're opposing each other, and, and they're sworn to oppose each other in public only. The leaders. Well, we're out of time, and there's something I want to, I'll mention to you, and, and hopefully we can do another show on that if you would come back. Uh, thanks, Alan, for coming on. We never take it for granted. We're always glad you're here. It's a pleasure. All right, God bless you. Take care now. You too. Bye-bye. Bye now.